It's so good to see all of you here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm Lisa German. I'm the university librarian and dean of libraries. And thank you so much for taking the time to join us and to kick off this amazing exhibit, Symbolic Significance, Tracing the History of Jewish High Holidays and the First Day of School. This exhibit documents how over decades of time, Jewish community members have made significant progress in our state by persuading school officials to recognize high, the Jewish high holidays as they plan their academic calendars. And thanks to committed effort, no longer, at least in many Minnesota schools, are Jewish families forced to decide between sending their children to school or honoring their religious practice. I'd like to point out that the exhibit would not be possible if not from the, for the incredible materials that make up the University of Minnesota's Berman Upper Midwest Jewish Archives. And of course, I want to thank those individuals, the families, the synagogues, and the organizations who have generously entrusted these treasures and often very personal materials to our care so that they could be used to teach, inform, and enlighten students, faculty on campus, and scholars from around the world. Finally, this exhibit would not exist if it wasn't for our staff, most notably our brilliant archivist, Kate Dietrich, and our talented, talented exhibit coordinator and designer, Darren Terpstra. Thank you so much to both of you. Before I turn this over to Kate, I'd like to acknowledge the peoples on Poon, whose land we meet. The University of Minnesota Twin Cities is built with the, within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. It is important to acknowledge the peoples whose land we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relationship with tribal nations. But we also acknowledge that words are not enough, and we must ensure that our institution provides support, resources, and programs that increase access to all aspects of higher education for American Indian students, staff, faculty, and community members. I'd also like to just take a minute to acknowledge that today is 9-11. Um, like all of you who were born before 2001, I remember where I was. I was in room 246 of the main library at the University of Illinois. Um, some of you were in this country then. Some of you were traveling and out of the country. And I'd just like to acknowledge that um, this is a time for reflection for me, um, and also as we're, as we're approaching um, Rosh Hashanah, I know it's a time for reflection for us all. So now, please welcome Kate Dietrich, archivist for the Berman Upper Midwest Jewish Archives. Thank you, Dean Lisa. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out. So my name is Kate Dietrich. I'm the archivist for the Upper Midwest Jewish Archives and the curator for this exhibit. And I'm, I'm really thrilled to see so many people here. I think when you start to work on an exhibit, you lose all perspective. Um, you just get so into the research and you think, this is too big of a topic. This is too small of a topic. Uh, this is really interesting. This is not interesting at all. <laughs> is this interesting? I think it is. Um, and so it's really great after all of this work to see that this is interesting, that people are interested in this. So thank you so much for coming. Um, I hope that you had an opportunity to check out the exhibit. If you didn't, there'll be plenty of time after this. So the impetus for this exhibit dates back to 2021 when the University of Minnesota chose not to switch their first day of classes when it conflicted with Rosh Hashanah. 
And as an archivist, I really wanted to give historical context to that decision because I knew that it was a continual conflict over the years. So I dug into the archives of the Jewish Community Relations Council, which is a hard task because that collection is over 100 boxes. Um, I found the years in the 1980s where the university did start classes on a Jewish holiday. And then there were years where the university chose not to start on a Jewish holiday. And I put these documents on our Facebook page, and people responded with their own memories. And I thought, maybe there's something here. You know, Perhaps this topic could be expanded upon. Thanks to a six-week research leave supported by the libraries, I was able to do a more in-depth, deep dive into the collections across the Upper Midwest Jewish archives, as well as within university archives and collections over at the Minnesota Historical Society. And the results of all that research you can see up on the third floor. What I've learned from curating exhibits over the years is that, in my opinion, the value of the exhibits is only partially in the fact that archival documents are uplifted and placed in a wider and hopefully contemporary context to tell a compelling story. The other value is the conversations that are hopefully uplifted as the topic comes into a wider spotlight. And so with that in mind, I asked our wonderful panelists to come together this evening and talk through their thoughts and experiences, personally and professionally, around this topic. Um, so I think it's easiest if we just do a quick rundown of the panel. If you could just quickly introduce yourself and give us a quick bio. We've got the, sorry that you have to share the microphones. Limited budget. <laughs> We should be. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. I am uh, Benji Kaplan. I have been the executive director of Minnesota Hillel, the Jewish Student Center here at the university for the last uh, 10 years. Uh, and I'm glad to be here tonight to share, uh, at least from my experience, uh, the impact of this topic. I'm Natan Paradise. I am currently the director of the Center for Jewish Studies here at the University of Minnesota. Uh, prior to that, I was the associate director. And prior to that, I worked as an academic advisor in the College of CLA. That context is important because I was one of the people that students would come to when they were trying to navigate uh, the challenges of the calendar. And prior to that, I was an undergraduate at the University of Minnesota. <laughs> so I also lived this. I'm <clears throat> Ravellen Prell, and I am a professor emerita of American Studies. That means <clears throat> I retired a few years ago with honor. I did nothing to discredit <laughs> anybody. Um, I am trained as an anthropologist, but have spent a, a great deal of my career working on the history of American Jews and American Jewish culture. And in 2017, I co-curated A Campus Divided, which was uh, a major e exhibition of of the the archive and the libraries of the university, and began a life in public history, and worked very closely with Darren and and Kate as well. Steve Hariggs, JCRC of Minnesota and the Dakotas, Shana Tova, everyone, Kate, wonderful work, Darren, Lark, fantastic, three generations of University of Minnesota graduates in my family perhaps proudest of my grandmother, Dean German, uh, Library Science, 1929, Gladys Dover and Apple So there you have it. I didn't know that. All right, I think we're gonna dive right in. Uh, I have a few questions to pose to our panelists, um, but I wanna be clear that I'm just hoping for an open dialogue. So panelists, feel free to chime in, build upon what is said, pose your own questions. Um, so we're going to chat for a little bit, and then we're going to have time for some questions. And then after that, we will also have time to for those who haven't seen the exhibit yet to go up to the third floor. And I will be there to answer any questions that you might have as you are looking through the exhibit. Um, so first question, softball question. Um, do you personally have any memories of times where Jewish high holidays clashed with the first day of school? either personally or as a child, parent, and what was that like? 
Someone's got to start. <laughs> Anyone? I'll start. All right. There's two. Yeah, there's. Feel free. <laughs> First, the point of personal privilege. Like many of you, I was here the day with President Yudoff and Governor Anderson when the Jewish Archive was inaugurated mm -hmm. in this very building. And I believe if President Yudoff was here and Governor Anderson were still with us, he'd be very proud of your work, Kate, because oh, I you. think you really live in that spirit. <laughs> Grew up in St. Louis Park, went to St. Louis Park schools. Interestingly, one of my memories is, and this was sort of an early accommodation by the high school, playing football games on Colney Dre starting at 2.30 in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So that was an interesting you know, accommodation made. <laughs> Had a school district, you saw a December Dilemma, some of the issues in the exhibit about how to teach religion, and I'm very proud that in the St. Louis Park School System, we had two very forward-thinking teachers, uh, Wes Bodine and Lee Smith, who created this uh, curriculum called World Religions. Mr. Bodine's still alive at age 92. And it was all about the academic study of religion, Hindu, Judaism, Buddhism, uh, Christianity, and Islam. And so that was something of the school district from which I came million dollars when a million dollars was something, right? That's what financed the curriculum from the United States Department of Education. But I also came from a school district for three years did not hire Jewish teachers, mm. right? You had this vast contradiction in the St. Louis Park School mm. uh, <clears throat> experience. So those are some of my early connections with some of the issues that permeate our culture to this day. Yeah. <clears throat> so I told Kate, rather than talking briefly about personal experience, I wanted to provide um, a little bit of historical context for this question, much of which you will see on the third floor when you climb up there uh, to see the exhibit. And I wanted to start to tell you my granddaughter is in second grade in the New York City school system. And here are the holidays that are observed in New York City when, uh, when there is no school. Uh, there is two days of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Eid uh, el uh, Adha, which is the Muslim feast of the sacrifice, the Lunar New Year, Diwali was just passed, which is the Hindu festival of light, Columbus Day, which actually is really honoring Italian Americans in New York, that's a kind of ethnic, Veterans Day, Thanksgiving, Election Day, mm. and Christmas and Easter are not, of course, marked, rather that's just when vacations are. Mm -hmm. So here in 2023, we have a school system that never says, oh no, not another one, <laughs> which is typically what would happen at the University of Minnesota if you suggested that maybe you would like to not start on Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur. So why, why, why were the Jewish New Year holidays mar uh, days off in New York City? It had nothing to do with students or their families. Yes, you got that. It had to do with the fact that the vast majority of the teachers in New York City were simply not coming to work. And so the superintendent passed this. And so I think what drives these kinds of changes, these ability to acknowledge schools and their relationship to different religious forces are first, of course, demographic. And Jews have always been uh, a very uh, a very real minority in Minnesota, which has led to uh, difficulties, I think, with Jewish holidays for public schools and school systems. But it's also ideological, mm -hmm. because following World War II, really during World War II, an idea emerged, which is sometimes called the tri-faith religion. And the idea that, in fact, radically, America was not a Protestant nation. It was a nation of three faiths. And it was the launching of religious pluralism in the popular imagination in the United States in response, of course, to World War II and what had happened there. And the idea of tri-faith America was that Catholics and Jews would have their rights of some kind of representation within the dominant culture and around religion. And it was not only honored to some extent in schools, to some extent, other than in New York, for obvious reasons, but it also coincided with a new Supreme Court 
that became an adjudicator of who was entitled to be recognized in terms of religious pluralism. And for that reason, the courts began to decide about the distribution of Bibles, the distribution of, of prayer, the observance of prayer in public schools, as I, I know that many of you know, about what could pay for transportation to private schools or not pay for that. And in most cases, Catholics dissented around, uh, around busing. They wanted their busing to parochial schools financed, which was held off for quite a while. What happened in this period was the court saying over and over, Protestantism is one faith, it is not the faith. And for that reason, this was the period that is referred to as the high wall of separation, a term, by the way, associated with Thomas Jefferson, that we needed a strong separation between church and state. So what was the best way to honor pluralism? It was by creating a neutral public sphere, something that Jews argued for for mm -hmm. much of our soj sojourn in the United States. This begins to shift, finally, um, in the 1970s, when, for the first time, there is a significant pushback that suggests a very different approach to the place of religion in the state. And under those circumstances, beginning with the evangelical right, there's a new kind of alliance between those who define themselves as religious and those <clears throat> that cuts across religions and those who want to continue to make a claim for what? For pluralism, for liberalism, for a neutral state that will not choose one religion or even religion over the non-religious. And that shift begins the process of pulling down that high wall of separation and changing it. One of the ironies of the tri-faith religion is that the more pluralist and tolerant the nation becomes, the more secular it becomes. Mm -hmm. And this is something that people of faith or people who are committed to faith traditions are really struggling with. Is it better for us to be neutral together or is it better for us to advance religion and then back again? Which religions will we advance? Who will decide what are the American religions? And that is what that is the moment we are in, I think, as you know. So what? why do we talk about calendars? We talk about calendars because we talk about culture. No culture exists without a calendar. Mm -hmm. And we talk about power. Who has the power to define the calendar? Who has the power to define what is an American religion and what the American calendar should look like? Mm -hmm. And how do we think about the relationship between the promise of an inclusive culture and the promise of visibility of religions. And I will end by telling you, this is the dilemma of the First Amendment. We were not helped by the founding ancestors who said in the First Amendment that everyone is entitled to observe religion, free of state control, and everyone is entitled not to have the state predict what religion is in charge. That dilemma is with us and will always be with us because of the complexity of the First Amendment. So when Kate said, this exhibition is about everything and small things, this exhibition is really about the entire history of freedom of religion in America that is dynamic and always changing. I, <laughs> I just want to quick butt in and say um, part of doing an exhibit is kind of figuring out your scope. And uh, Darren found me on day two of research stress eating chips in the atrium because I thought I'm going to have to talk about all of religion and education. And this is going to be a 45 panel exhibit. So thank you for summing up a lot of that that didn't make it to the exhibit. So sorry, Natan. So... So I was born in 1963. So my education really spanned this period that Ravellan's talking about, um, uh, with the, the core of my education being in, in the 70s in the schools. Um, and I grew up here in Golden Valley, and I was one of three Jewish students in my elementary school and seven, I think, Jewish students in middle school. And I think there were a whopping 
you know, 10 of us in my grade in, in high school. Uh, so the numbers weren't there. Um, and, and yet the school managed in most of its curriculum to ma- maintain this, this high wall. Uh, except, you know, a lot of you will recognize this, where? In the music program. Yep. Right? Mm-hmm. In the music program. And I love to sing, but I was never in choir because I couldn't bring myself to be singing all of those songs and to be part of what were explicitly Christmas mm-hmm. concerts, mm-hmm. right? And, and like many of my Jewish peers, was only annoyed when they threw in the token <laughs> Hanukkah song, right? <laughs> Endlessly annoying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I came to the University of Minnesota as a freshman, and I forgot this, Kate, until Kate sent me the graphic of the years in which we started on Rosh Hashanah. I was a freshman here in 1981 when Rosh Hashanah was the start date. That was my first start at the University of Minnesota. And I forgot all about it until I saw Kate's graphic. And then that memory came crashing back on me, the confusion I had. Uh, and I and the anxiety, it just washed over me, the anxiety that I'm missing the first two days of classes. And they might give my seat away, <laughs> even though I contacted my professors and the policy was they couldn't. There was that fear, and I'm an anxious kid, that they were going to give my seat away. And what would I be missing? And what wouldn't I understand about the course expectations? Because I was new to college, even if my dad was a professor. It was new to me. Uh, And yet I forgot about it. And I think the fact that I forgot about it later, until I saw the graphic, is an indication of how normalized it is. And has become, and how I spent much of my career in academia dealing with the holidays, conflicting with, if not the start of the semester, certainly classes during the semester. Um, And as a student, having always to negotiate that. Um, And now as an instructor, every year having to plan my syllabi around the holidays Um, and checking ahead of time, when are the holidays this semester? So I have to ask the chair, can I teach on these days? Because that way I can minimize the number of days that I have to cancel and still get all the material in. Uh, And that's been such a normal part of my life that the anxiety of the start of my academic career faded into the background. So you've gotten some really great... (laughs) <laughs> answers from the panel up here, and and uh, I have want to make sure we get to more of the questions tonight. But I would offer too that um, as somebody growing up in St. Paul, um, even on times when there was a an opportunity for the school to move for holidays, um, the understanding wasn't there because there was two other components that were added on top of it, which was, oh yeah, we'll make that adjustment, but you as the Jewish student we'll get up in front of the school and teach everybody about these things, mm-hmm. right? So we are now putting you in that situation. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other being, oh, yeah, of course, we won't have school on that date for you, but here's all your homework. So when you get home from shul, make sure you do all of your homework because your assignments are still due at the same time as everybody else. Mm-hmm. Um, So this exhibit, if you've already seen it, it is not explicitly about the University of Minnesota. But since we are here, I have access to those archival documents. And so the university pops up time and again. In 2021, the University of Minnesota still chose to start classes on Rosh Hashanah, even though other school districts chose to switch their date. Um, So when did you all kind of first realize this clash would occur? And were you a part of any conversations around it with university leadership? And I feel like I want to start with Benji on this one, since you do show up in the exhibit. (laughs) Um, So the the holiday was 2021, but uh, we had informed the university that this was going to be an issue uh, five years prior. Um, The Hillel, uh, myself, the Hillel director and our rabbi at the time, uh, had a meeting with the Office of Equity and Diversity, informed them that this was going to uh, become an issue, um, and asked if we could be part of the process of trying to come up with a a better solution. Um, We were told at the time that they would look into it and get back to us. Uh, Three years later, uh, we were told that... um, 
the president was moving on from the university um, and that they would get back to it once a new president was selected. By that time, it was just a few months, and uh, we were informed that it is a, actually a six-year process uh, to be able to change dates uh, on the university calendar. So uh, sort of some frustration around um, giving plenty of notice from our perspective um, and trying to go through the correct channels. Um, and there are some good channels that have been created because of it that perhaps Natan uh, can speak on. But um, being, it would have been nice to know at that fifth year out that it took six years as opposed to having to wait uh, four and a half years to find out that our efforts were for naught. And didn't you also do some research about other Big Ten schools? No one else We were started. the only Big Ten school that started on Rosh Hashanah. Mm -hmm. Every other Big Ten, there were Big Ten schools that had class on Rosh Hashanah, but we were the only one that did not make adjustments to ensure that the first day of classes were not. Mm -hmm. It first really came on my radar, I think in the spring mm -hmm. of 2021, and I think it really got on my radar because Benji... <laughs> called me probably or emailed me and said, yeah, we're getting nowhere. Um, uh, and then, of course, it was starting to be in, in the press. Uh, and so I, I spent that summer um, contacting all of the people that I know here and there and everywhere. Uh, the advantage of, of having worked as an advisor here is that I know a lot of people um, in the offices that tend to get things done. Uh, and it became very clear that, that the decision was made and it wasn't going to change, um, and that we were now in the realm of damage control. And the provost's office was drafting their communications uh, both to faculty and to students about how to manage the beginning of the semester that was going to be on Rosh Hashanah, like it or not. Um, and it became my role to say, okay, those communications are wholly inadequate uh, and, and don't really protect the students sufficiently, um, and here's what you need to be saying. Uh, and, and to their credit, the people in the provost's office did hear that um, and did redraft their statements and, and largely adopted a lot of the language that I provided uh, so that it at least minimized a little bit uh, of the anxiety about students losing their seat on the first day of class. Uh, it took the burden off of the students and put it more on the faculty um, as something that they had to um, respect and, and preserve seats for students. Uh, and yet it was also clear that it was a completely inadequate response that other schools managed to avoid and we didn't. Mm -hmm. City next to Rivell, and maybe add this piece of historical context too. I was just looking at the 2004 population study of the federations. 75% of Jewish households had a graduate from the University of Minnesota, wow. which is absolutely astonishing when you realize the fulcrum for upward mobility that the University of Minnesota has been over the years. Yet, sitting next to Rivell, and yet again, <laughs> the campus divided this remarkable exhibit about. Uh, the issues, the discrimination, the prejudice which Jewish students faced on campus. Of course, we know the stories of quotas in the professional schools, too. On the other hand, starting after the war, medical school, law school, other schools, it became yet again, as I said before, uh, opportunities for upward advancement for the Jewish community. So it's a remarkably mixed bag at the University of Minnesota. Over the years, and probably that's a fair characterization, too, of the experience that JCRC has had with the university, sometimes successful with respect in working with Hillel and working with Jewish studies, other times failure, right, too. So, you know, try to make sense of it. It's not easy to make sense of it. You see David Lebedoff writing to President McGraw, right, David Lebedoff, former regent, Bob Lass, former regent, Regent Cohen. I've had many Jewish regents over the years. Nevertheless, these struggles, too. Pivot for one minute here, and that is the JCRC experience with September 7, 2021, first day of school for all public school kids mm -hmm. in Minnesota. And we wrote to all the superintendents of uh, school districts with any significant number of Jewish students, and we did not have one school district that did not start the day after, on Wednesday, September 8th. So in a much shorter period of time, probably a year out, we began writing to the school superintendents, 
didn't have any issues, some discussions, but no issues with the public schools in Minnesota. Finally, one little note here. I happened to have been at St. Thomas Academy discussing some issues with their director of diversity and a vice president. Uh, <clears throat> some educational opportunities that JCRC is going to provide to St. Thomas Academy. But they took the time to tell me, just a handful of Jewish kids at St. Thomas Academy, a primarily Catholic school, about how important it is for them to provide spaces for their Jewish students and opportunities for their Jewish students there and making sure that they feel at home and comfortable at St. Thomas Academy. St. Thomas Academy, a Catholic military uh, mm -hmm. school, you know, contrast that with some of the experiences we've had at the university, good, bad, and indifferent. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Um, with everything that the Jewish community is facing, the issue of Jewish high holidays and the first day of school clashing isn't necessarily the most important thing, as I point out in the last panel of the exhibit. Um, but really what I tried to posit in the exhibit is that it is still important, that it reflects the society at large and their understanding and tolerance for minority communities. Um, do you agree with me? Do you think we should still take this clash seriously? And if you disagree, I love it. I was, you read my mind because Katie was your last question. I was hoping you'd get to it. Yes. Because it is the threshold existential question before <laughs> us here. And I'll pull in a high holy day a metaphor here. We say cheshbon ha-nefesh, right? Mm -hmm. During this period of time, checklist of the soul. And to me, this is a classic case of cheshbon ha-nefesh how you treat your students, any students, when trying to reconcile their identity versus necessity, their identity, Jewish students, necessity, being in school. How do we avoid that contradiction, that conflict? And if a university or any school is serious about its mission, they will find a way for its Jewish students not to, and any students not to face this conflict. And that's why, to me, it's as important as any issue you will face. Hmm. Uh, so if this were a debate, I'm on Steve's team. <laughs> because <the> <laughs> um, if you uh, read any of the great literature of African-American writers in the United States, if you look at any of the writings of, of immigrants, post-65 immigrants, if you look at the writing of Yiddish writers, um, in the time of immigration or whatever. There's a theme that always cuts across it, and it's the theme of invisibility. What it feels like to not be seen. What it feels like to not be counted. I, and we could certainly say the same thing for, for women, for LBGT, all of it. It's invisibility which means that sometimes the smallest recognition says you're here, you're part of this. University calendars are very complicated things. I was so shocked to learn from Benji what actually happened and how he was treated. And had Benji said, hey, you know, in a few months, this is gonna happen, but that isn't what Benji did. He did the exact right thing from the point of view of a university administrator. He got way out ahead of the problem and asked them to step up. And that level of invisibility, or certainly what I experienced over my many decades at the university, annoyance, frustration, oh, not another complaint. And by the way, what happens for minority groups, Jews among us, is you are made to feel uncomfortable for asking. You are made to feel it's your problem. You are made to feel that this is not appropriate. And if you are, by the way, as I assure you, my colleague Elaine Tyler May will probably talk about in the discussion, when, peop when you are untenured or you are the first woman in your department and you are uncomfortable saying to the chair, I can't do this, it's very complicated. Mm -hmm. And by the way, in the discussion about the New York City schools, there was this idea of, uh, this is too much, why don't we just have personal days that any student can take off? Mm -hmm. And I was amazed to read that parents feel in that complicated school system that absences are one of the things that are counted against you when you try to get into an academic high school or middle school. Mm. And it is, there's fear among 
immigrants and their children, that if they do take off those Muslim holidays or Hindu holidays, it could actually affect them. Mm. And so this sense of marginalization that is so endemic for all minorities, women are not a minority, is exactly this. Are we entitled or are we going to continue to be made to feel that Protestant majoritarian view of you are a guest at our table and that's what we all really, really need to work against? So I, th I think um, spreading this uh, far and wide is extremely important and continuing to push. You know, when this first came up for 2021, some of the excuses we were getting were um, there's contracts with the Minnesota State Fair that don't allow us to start earlier, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. certain number of days that we need to have in the classroom for accreditation so we can't start any later, and it was always these hurdles put in the in way of, like, we can't do it because, we can't do it, we can't do it because. But then I look at a year like this one where, uh, because of 2021, the... Um, the sorority life community came to Hillel over the summer and said, we realize that our schedule for sorority rush this year is during the Jewish holidays. Can you help us think through it? Mm -hmm. And while we didn't come to a perfect solution, there are no programs happening this coming weekend for sorority rush during Rosh Hashanah. And they are handing out information about Rosh Hashanah gatherings at Hillel to all the women taking part and letting them know that if they would like to go, they can. So there is this knowledge base that allows for there to be change, whether it's through the university or in other sectors. And the more that people can come and see the work that you've done here and hear the stories of how change can, can work and impact students, um, I think it'll be for the better of uh, the university. So yes, Kate, this is vitally important. <laughs> um, I mean, look, four generations of my family, to Steve's point, have gotten degrees at the University of Minnesota. And four generations of my family have had employment at the University of Minnesota. So this is, this is like our family business. Uh, and, and so we ought to feel like we belong here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, I spend a lot of time, I spend a lot of my time doing uh, diversity, equity, inclusion work on, on this campus. And the university claims that it is committed to equity and inclusion. And if it is, then it ought to be. Mm -hmm. And the way I frame it is if you are an inclusive and equitable campus, then nobody can be required to check their identity at the door in order to participate. Mm. Nobody can be required to check their identity at the door in order to participate. And when we arrange our calendar such that people have to make a choice, a forced choice, between their identity, whether it's their religious identity or their cultural identity, and go to services or whatever they want to do on the holiday, or skip all of that and only adhere to the University of Minnesota identity and go to class, then we are asking them to check their identity at the door. Mm -hmm. And that's not equitable and it's not inclusive. And it doesn't just affect the Jewish students, the Jewish faculty, uh, and, and the Jewish staff. And I have been all three of those. <laughs> it affects lots of our students whose identities don't fit into the Christian calendar. We have Muslim students who for an entire month out of the academic year, and this will be true for them for their entire academic careers, including graduate school, if they do that, because Ramadan falls during the academic year until I think 2041 or 2042, okay? Um, and so for a month out of their academic career, for all four years undergraduates, they're going to be fasting during the day mm -hmm. and sleeping very little at night. And if we can't accommodate that in ways that are respectful and allow them to be successful, then we are not meeting our mission. Mm. And so this is important, and it's important for the Jewish community because clearly they don't listen to us, and so we don't have as big a voice as we think we do. But we do have a voice, and we ought to use it not only on our own behalf, but on behalf of the Muslim students and the Muslim students and the Hindu students and all the students whose needs don't align with the academic calendar which has always been constructed around the Christian calendar. Mm -hmm. So it, it really matters. Yeah. And it's hard. 
uh, as punishment for my sins because I made trouble after Benji called me, um, the, the president created a task force on the academic calendar. And I got put on the, ca- on the task force and, <laughs> and more work to do and all these meetings to go to. Uh, that's right. But it's good to have a voice. Uh, and, and I did learn how complicated the calendar is. Um, and the contracts with the state fair are, are a real thing. Um, because our parking ramps are committed uh, and our dorms are committed and some of our students are committed um, and, and they're legal contracts and, and it's income for the university, millions of dollars that we will lose. So it's a real thing. Um, and in order to receive federal financial aid, we have to have a certain number of days in the semester. And by policy, there's supposed to be a certain number of study days at the end of the semester during finals week. Uh, and so it's a pretty tight schedule. But it's a schedule that can be adjusted if you're willing to do it. And those arguments are hard to make. And I have to say it was a little discouraging. I told Kate this in the hallway to go through the exhibit and see some of the same arguments that I was having with the task force were made 20 years ago and 40 years ago and 60 years ago and 80 years ago. And many of those arguments are around inconvenience, right? It it's possible to adjust the fall semester, and we're hoping the commitment will be that in 2032, when this happens again, that it will be adjusted so that we start a little bit later. It might not be two days later, but one day later, but at least it's something. Uh, and the students lose a study day at, during finals week, and the semester is going to end right smack dab up against Christmas. And there are people who say, oh, that's, that's too inconvenient. And my response was, you know what? You can be inconvenienced once every 30 years, <laughs> right? Because a whole lot of the rest of us are being inconvenienced every year on a regular basis in the way we plan our courses, in the way we conduct our exams, uh, in the choices that we have to make in order to feel like we belong and are successful in this institution. So is it difficult? Yes. Is it vitally important for this institution to become what it needs to be? Yes. Thank you. So I want to make sure that we have time for questions. So Lark is here with a microphone. So if you have a question, raise your hand, but please wait until you get the microphone so everyone can hear. All right. So we'll start up here. Oh, and please make your questions brief so we can get to more of them. Uh, So I, I support the idea that school shouldn't start on uh, Rosh Hashanah. I'm glad to learn it only happens every nine years. But just on a more practical matter, (coughs) there's 50,000 students, uh, some number like that, that that go to this campus, maybe more. And just in budgetary terms, and who who, who are you going to inconvenience the most? Uh, when you when you say, well, there's 2,000 Jewish kids, we can inconvenience the other 48,000 and and you know make them rush some other days, or we can inconvenience the 2,000, mm-hmm. and yeah. uh, that's <clears throat> that's got to be a problem, many many places because the Jewish population is so small. Mm-hmm. The fact that they have some accommodation so a student a Jewish student doesn't get you know docked for you know. Uh, turning in reports or docked for uh, uh, l- 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 late late anything is is really helpful. Yeah. But just in a practical manner, I'll ask the panel to answer. In a practical manner, yeah. uh, you know, how do you how do you manage this with with I'll, I'll call it for the greater good. Yeah. Okay. Does anyone want to take that? Otherwise, I don't know if this is a, a specific answer to the question. <laughs> Perhaps there's a better answer down the road. But I had always thought, you know, when they got the answer. Um, that for accreditation purposes, we can't start later. And I said, well, have you sent a letter to the accreditation organization saying, um, by the way, we're going to have to um, tell Jewish students they have to have this because of you? And see what their response is. Instead of, you know, the the university doesn't have to own it. If if it really is the accreditation organization's fault that they can't have one less day of class, um, why isn't that the message going out to Jewish students? Um, I think part of it is that there is so much turnover within the offices that are making these decisions 
that it's an inconvenience to be the person that might have to make that decision and make the hard decision. And they're just going to kick it down the road till the next person comes along. And I think if you look at the decades long history that's upstairs, um, a lot of that is, you know, I don't want to be inconvenienced personally. So I'm going to kick it down. Somebody else can deal with it. It's not an inconvenience on a university level. It's an inconvenience for the individual that gets to help make those decisions. Yeah, th this is the, a, a question that comes up all the time, and it's an important question. I'm glad you asked it. Um, so when this happens again in, in 2032, and if we start a day late, uh, and if that means that the semester doesn't end until right before Christmas, um, it will mean that some few number, thousand students and faculty um, will get at least one day of Rosh Hashanah where they don't have to make a choice. Uh, and it means that 26,000 students will have a little bit of a more challenging finals week. Um, and some of them will have to buy more expensive tickets to get home for Christmas, um, although not as many as you think, because a lot of the faculty will also say, well, I'm not giving an exam. If it's that late, it'll be a take home and you can do whatever. Uh, <laughs> so, so it won't inconvenience that many. But it's true that there, there will be some number of people who will have been inconvenienced for once in their academic life. Um, but also, I think it's important to remember that as an institution that is educating students for their professional and civic lives, that there is tremendous value in giving them the experience of learning how to be considerate of people whose needs are different from their own. Mm -hmm. Many of these people are going to be leaders of corporations, and they are going to be having employees who will have different needs in an increasingly diverse world. And they're going to need to figure out how to keep those employees. And when you don't respect them, and when you don't make them feel like they, be they belong, they don't stay. I almost quit at the University of Minnesota when I was an advisor because even though university policy said that I could use flex time to cover the Jewish holidays, my supervisor required me to use vacation days. And in some years, that was 11 or 12 out of my 20 vacation days that were going to cover the holidays, something that none of my other colleagues had to do. Right? So do we want to be an institution that educates its students how to be successful as professionals and citizens in a world where people get respected in this way? And I think the answer is yes. And part of the way they learn to do that is experiencing a little bit of inconvenience once every 30 years. So uh, there's something interesting about the question of the greater good. So you'll see when you tour the uh, exhibition on the third floor that there was a point that the university could choose between uh, starting in a, uh, on the calendar uh, to respect Rosh Hashanah, or they could uh, change a football game date, and they immediately chose on behalf of the football <laughs> game. So that's a real question. What is the greater good? Is the greater good a value-free decision, or is it driven by other kinds of values? And so I would say, I mean, I appreciate you voicing that, because I think everyone who hears these discussions always does think in those terms about is the greater good value free? Or in fact, are we all in agreement about what the greater good is? Or how do we define or who's entitled to define the greater good? And you know, if you go back to the Bill of Rights, what makes an American democracy what is a democracy is not the majority rule, it is protecting the rights of the minorities. Yeah. That is the greatness of the system that we are in. That is what a true democracy is. It is not majority rules. And so then the question is one of value judgments. How do we define the rights of minorities? What does it mean, as I said, that the court had to keep deciding and decides many, many times over and over what are religious rights, who is protected in those rights, and um, I think it's, it's really helpful to introduce that concept of a greater good to then start to excavate it and see what we actually mean by it. Yeah. Great question, Bob. JCRC board member, very proud of Bob. There. <laughs> <laughs> 
But to, again, to Riv Allen's point, you know, passage of the 14th Amendment after the Civil War, which was the greatest achievement of the Civil War, was uh, equal protection of the law, due process, the 14th Amendment, is simply this issue, right? Life is not all about practicality, but as Riv Allen would say, the balancing of a majoritarian culture with minority rights, right? And that's something that we have to wrestle with as a society. You look at these different... Uh, <coughs> plaques, and what do we call the exhibit? Uh, panels. Panels, thank you, panels. And you see my distinguished predecessors, people like Sam Shiner, Mort Rywick, uh, Steve Silberfarb, and I know these questions they wrestled with hard uh, because it's just the nature of the job, but it's interesting to see over the decades, they all came down, and our board all came down on the same side, uh, that this is a battle we need to fight, right, for all the reasons that have been expressed here. So. Great question, and there's probably no necessarily completely right or completely wrong answer, but perhaps the center of balance falls on the side of this is where we need to assert, and not only on our behalf of the Jewish community, but other communities, the importance of the protection of minority rights. Mm -hmm. All right, we can have one really short question. If we want to get, <laughs> I know you're here. We can get you. There. I want to be respectful of people's time, so one more quick question, and then we can wrap up and have more time. Kate, as the granddaughter of a letter that you have exhibited of Milton Firestone to Arthur Brynn, mm -hmm. my two grandfathers on either side of the river, I thank you for that document mm -hmm. and want to bring up what my grandfather Milton Firestone said. I've had a case of what I clearly think is anti-Semitic through the schools, and I want to warn you that might be happening in Minneapolis. And this was my experience. How much of this to maybe wave a red herring do you think is anti-Semitic? Mm, the million dollar question. Does anyone want to? I, 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 I just want to say, um, for those that were here back in 2017 for a campus divided, um, I, I feel like um, there's, a, there's some answer in that, I would say. Um, for those that didn't get to see that, I think it's a campusdivided.umn.edu to check out a little bit more of that. Um, so before we close, um, I just one last, well, first let's give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you so much for being willing to share. Um, but one last thing, the former executive director of the Jewish Historical Society of the Upper Midwest, Catherine Tain, has asked to say a few words before we close out. So. What a fabulous evening. And thank you, Kate, for all your hard work. And I know it was hours and hours of research in those archives. And thank you to the panel. You guys added such depth to what Kate has presented. <clears throat> I wanted to talk to you about the Jewish Historical Society of the Upper Midwest, which was created nearly 40 years ago by community members just like yourselves who saw the importance of our collecting and telling our own stories, the stories that Dean German said, are treasures. There are treasures. And even though we make up less than 1% of Minnesota's population, we have much to be proud of in contributing to Minnesota's story way beyond our population size. And this goes to what Reeve Ellen Prell, Prell was saying about being invisible. If we don't save these stories, if we don't collect these stories, we remain invisible. And as we know, it's History is told by the larger population. So it's incumbent on us to make sure our story is part of Minnesota's story. Our, our society founders saw how easily that story could be lost. So the archives were built by Dr. Linda Max Schloff, who's here, slowly, painstakingly, as oral histories were gathered, photographs solicited, personal and organizational papers gathered. The society board voted a bit more than 10 years ago, shortly after Linda retired, 
to give that one-of-a-kind collection to the University of Minnesota and place them here in the Nathan and Teresa Berman archives, creating a worldwide 24-7 accessible collection, I used to say, where you could be in your pajamas at midnight and find out anything you wanted to know, <laughs> which is how I do my research, if you're wondering. Um, and this, the, making this collection accessible, chronicling the activities of the Jewish community in our region. If you haven't seen those caverns, I'm sure Kate would arrange a tour for you. It's quite fascinating. Four stories down in these limestone caves, I understand, could even survive a nuclear attack. So we know they're well cared for. Your families, your synagogues, your organizations that you gave your time and treasure to are here in those limestone caves in perpetuity for future researchers, authors, filmmakers to find and share these unique to our upper Midwest Jewish experience stories for future generations. These are not the stories of New York Lower East Side. These are not the stories of Hollywood's version of Jewish immigrants. They are particular to us. They're about cowboys and, and um, Builders of sod houses in the in the Dakotas. Um, they're amazing, amazing stories. Just our stories. They aren't typical anywhere else in the U.S. They're stories about adapting, building our communities, preserving against anti-Semitism and misunderstanding to forge a strong, sustained community, creating future Jewish generations. It's a rich story with much to teach, as we heard tonight. The, our, the Berman Collection archivist, Kate, has stepped into Linda's role over the last 10 years, making the collection available to anyone interested in carrying on collecting today's stories. She's done it all at a half-time position. We know some materials have evaded her grasp, and once they're gone, they're gone, and may not be represented in this collection simply because time does not allow. So I'm asking you to consider a gift to the Berman Archives campaign. We're hoping to raise 1.6 million so that we can create a full-time position for Kate. We'd like to increase her time. We'd like to grow this collection even further so no story escapes the full telling of the upper Midwest Jewish community. So let's come together in recognition of the importance of preserving, collecting, and connecting others to the new, unique history of our region. And it's really easy, you guys. You just have to Google Berman Upper Midwest Jewish Archives and click on your gift. And even better, just bookmark it. And every time you need to make a contribution to honor a Simca, just make it to the archives. And you know, your gift giving is done for the year, for the next. <laughs> or the next. So I hope we have you full time shortly. And thank you, thank you. Oh, a nice envelope is right by the door. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, if you haven't seen the exhibit, I am actually going to head right up to the third floor. I will be there. If you have any questions about any of the panels, I will be on hand um, to answer anything. So thank you to our panelists once again. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.